Let's talk about your your previous day job, working mm-hmm. in Downing Street for Boris Johnson. Mm-hmm. You were his deputy chief of staff, even though there wasn't actually a chief of staff. Which I think tells you <laughs> quite a lot <laughs> about Boris the organisation. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, at, well, explain exactly what your job was. What did you do during the course of the day? Because you'd think deputy chief of staff, you're, you know, it's like the West Wing and you're charging around corridors and mm-hmm. ordering around great offices of state. Yeah, so the, the bulk of it was just trying to keep the show on the road day to day so deciding kind of who should be in what meetings where they should happen particularly with covid obviously a lot of people had to zoom in and that Mm. kind of thing to keep them um secure and um i mean a lot of it really was and again this is particularly with covid in mind trying to separate what needed to happen kind of day to day who was taking care of like the data dashboard who was working on vaccines and so forth who was thinking about what needed to be said at the press conference later and then just new incoming stuff that needed to be dealt with whether it was kind of school exams so it was almost like being a little um uh a, a, a kind of offshoot spot to kind of put the right people onto the right tasks so it's it's pretty administrative to be honest i wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm a massive policy brain or data person or comms person, but I was quite good at kind of allocating tasks, which is pretty much what I do at home. (laughs) (laughs) And you basically ended up nannying Boris Johnson when he caught COVID. Yeah, exactly. I mean, particularly the... He he was quite a bad patient. He was not ideal. Um, But I think particularly when he was recovering, um, he'd obviously been hit by it very, very hard. And... This, the state isn't necessarily set up to deal with just a fundamentally unwell prime minister. And so kind of thinking about what he was eating, whether he was getting some rest and what his schedule was doing, certainly in the early stages of him coming out of it felt quite important. But partly that's because, you know, again, because this is the way the state is set up, he's the ultimate decision maker on a lot of things. So you need to have him best set up so that everybody else can get on with their jobs. And in doing that, tell us about the iPads. Oh, yeah. So I wasn't incredibly involved with the iPads, but hes I would not say he's particularly tech literate. Yeah. Um, so he when he would be, a few times he was kind of pinged, so he was isolating, but he obviously was joining meetings via Zoom. Um, but he quite often hit the wrong button or halfway through kind of swipe it off. So we had to kind of line up iPads to slip under the door um, <laughs> <laughs> so he could get onto the next one. All ready to go. And then he kept coming out and you had to sort of barricade him in. Yes, yes. He wasn't... He's just... He likes to see what people are up to. I wonder whether this kind of dates back to being in newspapers and so on and kind of, you know, roaming around and, and seeing what's happening. See that little bit here at News UK. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, he, 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 he essentially needed to be... He, he, he just couldn't... I couldn't keep the door open or or indeed kind of close him in because I need to see what he was up to. So you put these chairs across. Like a, um, like a sort a of barrier. child's stair gate. Exactly. Keep him locked in. Yeah, and it, it totally worked. So he, hearing those stories, it's perhaps not the greatest surprise though, that some rules were broken in, in Downing Street. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your, because you brought you there, I think, did you organise the, the birthday party which didn't even have a cake? Well, I was asked to organise it. Yeah. But yeah, I was at that event and I, you know, uh, was fined for it and I, you know, couldn't regret it more and I wish I could take it all back and I apologise for it. Um, uh, but I, I do think, I mean, it's it's really difficult, again, I suppose, a year on from the Sue Gray report that, yeah. where it must have felt like for particularly some of the families who've lost, you know, friends, mm-hmm. to, friends and family members to COVID and certainly the doctors and nurses who are working in A&E to feel like they kind of got some questions answered on what was going on in yeah. Downing Street. And then this week to hear that potentially there's there's another lie on top of a lie. Obviously, Boris Johnson can the answer stuff this. stuff with what happened at Chequers. Were you involved exactly. in any of that? The, no, the, I wasn't. What was going on at Chequers? I, didn't, I didn't know about that, any of that. So it's, it's come as a surprise to me. But I think what is so... It must be so difficult for those people to kind of come to terms with, yeah. actually, is this going to be opened up all over again? But also for, you know, a lot of the officials who are working in Downing Street it feels like their time there has been sort of defined now by Partygate and the, they were working incredibly hard. They're really bright young people and they were doing, you know, nothing compared to being in the front line in yeah. a hospital, but still pretty harrowing stuff. You know, where we I remember days when we were looking at potential sites for mass graves and 
looking at renting ice rinks to use as morgues and, you know, really trying to work out how we could keep pregnant women safe going in to give birth, but but also potentially they'd have to do it alone. And um, I really hope that this eventual COVID inquiry, once it gets going, and obviously that's looking a bit confused yeah. as well at the moment, will try and kind of address what they were doing so that lots of these families and, and the public in general get a better picture of what people were doing with their time and it wasn't all partying. Do you think, I, I do think the, the, the birthday party without the cake and the cabinet was one thing. Mm. When we look at what happened the night before Prince Philip's funeral uh, and some of the other, you know, clear, you know, in the, the Sue Gray's report talks about wine up the walls and mm. all that sort of stuff. Was there a cultural problem in Danny? And having worked actually for Theresa May and then Boris Johnson, do you think the same thing would have happened if Theresa May had been like the least party party person you could think of? Do you think it would have happened with a different... Is it something about Boris Johnson, the way he behaves, the sort of people he surrounds himself with? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I didn't know about those events until we read about them, in the, you know, once it all came out. But I, I definitely think it's the case that a culture is set from the top mm. and... I don't think this stuff would have happened under Theresa May and whether people feel like they have a kind of boss who either kind of implicitly gives permission or in fact encourages um, is you know, something that yeah, obviously yeah. needs some like psychological examination. But um, I would have been extremely surprised had this kind of thing happened under Theresa May. And what do you think, when I say the name Boris Johnson, mm. what, what do you think now? I think, um, gosh, he gets still gets a lot of oxygen, doesn't he? But I mean, I've I've obviously had I, I I don't know how much your listeners know about this, but I had a slightly weird end to my time working with him, where um, I still to this day don't quite know if I was fired or if I or if I resigned. Which so, uh, he, so he'd fired Dominic Cummings. Yeah, well, uh, uh, even he, that ended on Dominic like weird, Cummings quite friendly had terms. Had left, yes. But despite that, you were essentially Dominic Cummings' right hand woman. You stayed, but, yeah. but Boris Johnson just couldn't cope with the you still being around. I mean, I, d I don't quite know what he was <laughs> thinking, but like I said, it became pretty clear yeah. that that it just wasn't going to be like an old lamp. Yeah, he what he was trying to say was it. Fe it's like Dominic and I have divorced, and we're doing up our furniture, and you're um, this like old lamp that's left over, and I didn't know what to do with it, which made me feel amazing. Um, I think one of the things that really helped was... Some natural charm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ladies, really. just, so, uh, so I just well. don't know how he gets all these girls. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I actually found quite helpful was when I read some of the Anthony Selden extracts in the Sunday Times, yeah. and um, he, was, he was sort of explaining this conversation that Sajid Javid had with Boris Johnson when... Um, when Sa Boris was basically saying, you can stay a chancellor, but you can't keep your special advisors. Yeah. And Sajid said, no, I won't do that. And Boris said, they're just people. And I, I, I suddenly thought, oh, OK, I was just people. Makes and it's sense. actually kind of helpful in a way to... It helps you not take it as personally. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make you feel amazing, obviously, <laughs> but you do but think... But it wasn't just about you. Well, you think, cool, I can just go off and write my book now and, and I feel much more peaceful about it. <laughs> do you think it'll come back? Would you like... How would you feel if you woke up one morning and Boris Johnson was Prime Minister again? Um, I wouldn't feel great, I must say. I, I don't think um, it would be a brilliant thing for the country, but obviously that's not up to me. Um, I would just be very surprised about it. <laughs> but um, And who knows if he really wants to either, yeah, yeah. but it feels very unlikely to me that, you know, Particularly if he if he can't explain away these new allegations yeah. that um, people would necessarily want him back. Well, the, the latest allegations are about what went on at Checkers. Mm. So handily, we've got uh, a final extract from your book read oh by my Mariella God. Uh, <laughs> about something that happened at Checkers. Let's take a listen. In the grounds down below, the party is in full swing. One of the PM's protection officers nudges his colleague in the ribs and inclines his head at an upstairs stained glass window where the imprint of a pair of pale bum cheeks is undulating against the glass for anyone to see if the guests cared to look up from their involved conversations. There we are. 
<laughs> they well, what, what happens at sta- Checkers stays at Checkers. Well, until it appears in it, the papers, turns, obviously. Turns, <laughs> it might turn out that that's not a work of fiction at all. Yeah, that that's is really true. what was going on. Oh my god. Well, that's the trouble. There's a bunch of stuff that I ended up having to delete from my final <laughs> manuscript because it ended up happening in real life. Um, so you know, maybe I've done it again. And is this? I mean, I don't even just got this one out. Is this? Is this the first of several? I hope so. I mean, it depends if anyone buys it. Uh, So, um, yeah, just a gentle prod here. Um, But, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I'm working on a sequel to this book now, which will bring in the other opposition parties, which is quite important, so they get a little bit of uh, lampooning, a bit of action. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And um, and, uh, so we can see where the kind of main characters progress to as well. 